welcome to another amazing episode of Say It Online, where we help digital agency owners stop just randomly shouting into the void and start communicating meaningfully and effectively in this digital age. I'm your host, Say Gabriel, and this episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Nancy Content. If you're sick of conversion content being a huge pain in your agency's butt, especially websites, campaigns, etc., let's talk. With the smoothest content process ever, a team of unbelievably skilled and organized content strategists and years of subcontracting experience, Anansi is looking to make your life as a digital agency owner unbelievably easier. Just head, if you're interested, to anansicontent.com, that's A-N-A-N-S-I content.com, and hit Let's Talk. And now, without further ado, here's our episode. and welcome to another exciting episode of Say It Online, the podcast where we help digital agency owners communicate more effectively and more awesomely in this digital age and all of the challenges that come with it. I am super, super excited today to be welcoming one of our very own from a Nancy, Michaela Kemp to the show. Welcome, Michaela. Hello. So... uh, (laughs) always really exciting to me to uh, interview a strategist because I inevitably learn a whole bunch more about them. Michaela has been with us for quite a while. She specializes in a number of different industries and types of projects. Before we get into it, Michaela, why don't you just take a few minutes to tell us about yourself personally? Give us an overview of what it is you do for a Nancy. Personally, I have not been copywriting uh, for a huge amount of time, but I have done a lot of marketing. I used to do marketing and customer service and a bunch of things for a huge supplement company. I've kind of had a ton of different jobs, pretty much every job in the food industry you could imagine. I am a nutritionist. I've dabbled in a lot of things uh, before kind of settling down and deciding that copywriting was something that I not only really enjoyed doing, but actually was good at, <laughs> which is a nice blend. So with Nancy, I am a content strategist and copywriter. So I work with a bunch of different companies and organizations to basically build content and strategy that is completely custom to them and really speaks to not only them and their brand, but the people that they're trying to reach. And that's the thing I really love about copywriting is trying to get that connection and kind of tell that story. Mm, yes, mm-hmm. connection, <laughs> stories, and all of that awesome, awesome yes. stuff. So with these different uh, kind of positions you have, you've had, I know that uh, you have done a lot of writing in your variety of positions, as well as, uh, you know, we've chatted a bit about your original intention to be a career academic. What are some of the communication issues that you've come up with in your time as a copywriter or strategist? Well, sort of starting back to my university education, um, I have an English degree and I specialized in creative writing because I was going to be a doctoral candidate, creative writer, you know, famous novelist before I realized that I'm maybe not the best fiction writer. (laughs) And I don't like doing all of the academic elbow rubbing that you have to do. So one of the things I realized in one of my classes, we had to do a ton of prep for public speaking, give conference papers. And I often was critiqued for being too animated or not sounding air quotes professional enough and, you know, not wearing quite the right outfit to the conference. And it's something that I kind of struggled with. I really wanted to come across as extremely professional and like I know what I'm doing. But now as a copywriter, and I think especially with Nancy, just because you're much more conversational in even your own, you know, marketing and copywriting, it's kind of a nice place where I can have that more conversational tone and speak like a real human person, but also be an expert in something. Mm. So just for our listeners sake, I want to clarify here. So when you talk about talking like a real person, mm-hmm. which is something that we at Anansi are very, very big on, <laughs> and actually just uh, recently having interviewed Rachel Kay, we talked about that quite a bit. Are you referencing that in your interpersonal communication or specifically the things that you write? So more my interpersonal communication, the things that I write are very much dependent on who I'm sort of speaking for and writing for. So One thing I do always encourage clients and partners to do is 
I really like to write in a more casual tone. I think even in uh, stiffer industries, so I don't know, let's say like finance or tech, you are much more humanized when you use not necessarily slang, but shorter sentences, easy to understand language, you know, you relate to just normal people and normal problems. But it comes across more when I am like talking with my partners and speaking to the clients and I have to be like, okay, you know, like tone it down a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I know this is something that comes up a lot is that, first of all, we relate super well about being very effusive and maybe not quite fitting into that (laughs) typical corporate context. And uh, I think that's uh, one of the things I love about uh, building an anti and working with other entrepreneurs is that we're all a little bit misfits to some degree that have found our little slice of the world or something where we can really, as you said, be an expert while still being really authentic to ourselves. And one of the things I'm hearing from you is that during the kind of content planning process and content writing process, you're actually trying to draw that out of other people so that you can kind of reflect that in other people as well, that authenticity, even if it means being a little bit less formal. Is that what I'm hearing or correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, with one of my most recent projects, they were very reserved and I am not. (laughs) And so it was the harshest, I guess, personality clash. But by the end of our time together, which wasn't very long, we were joking and my cat is always a featured member of most of my videos meetings because she just can't stay away. They were like, oh, how's your cat? And we had a really lovely rapport that actually helped me really connect with them and I think write better content for them. Mm, That makes a lot of sense. You need to definitely know the client in order to write in their voice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And obviously also, of course, the client's client being the critical thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what sorts of kind of over the course of your journey on your way to Ananti and and with Ananti as well, what sorts of things have you really found you can do to improve your communication? Like in this most recent project, you mentioned that you went from kind of having radically different personalities to being very much on the same page. What are some things our listeners can perhaps do to create that sort of rapport, even if you do have conflicting personalities? I think one of the big things I learned is just to kind of own who you are and your style of communication. Know your nervous habits when it comes to communication. One of mine is to ramble a little bit. My hand talking increases. And so I just own that. So with Nancy, like we do a lot of video meetings and I just let people know. I'd be like, hey, I've done a lot of these meetings and I still get nervous. And that's why I over-exaggerate my facial features. It's just a nervous habit. I also have a theater background, (laughs) which never surprises anyone. Yeah, I do too. (laughs) By the way, listeners, in case you were wondering, yes, I also have a theater background. (laughs) (laughs) I did extracurricular theater for my entire, like from the time I was seven till like end of high school, which helped a lot with being comfortable in public speaking. But I, yeah, I think just owning, you know, own that. It's your particular brand and I can adjust that, but I probably am never going to be able to change it or develop a new personality at this point. So I try to work it to my advantage. <laughs> mm, this I'm so, so glad that you brought this up, Michaela, because, uh, well, as you definitely know, but maybe our listeners don't, <laughs> I'm a student of permaculture. And one of the permaculture principles that I reflect on my team all the time is that the problem is the solution. Uh, so what I'm hearing here is that you took the stuff that you know you potentially felt nervous about or that you know that you do that other people might notice and you essentially put it on the table right away and it sounds like you're a little bit vulnerable being like hey so just so you know yeah i've been doing this a long time but i still have these kind of like habits or etc just so you know that's what's going on for me you know and all of a sudden this thing is a strength because it's something they can relate to you on and be like, wow, okay, cool. As opposed to something that, you know, either because it is making you nervous in the background or because they're noticing it, not saying anything, you know, might actually be pulling away from the situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of the people that I've met with so far, this is kind of their first video meeting and they're nervous and they don't want to be on camera. And, you know, it's nice to kind of bond over that be like, hey, I now do this for a living and I still get really nervous. I get nervous for internal meetings. Like it's just totally normal and completely fine. And I will prepare. And it's, I don't know, it's kind of that like moment of solidarity at the beginning of each meeting. (laughs) Mm, Yeah, yeah, no uh... (laughs) 
that was at that for Canadian. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> for sure. But it's true, right? Like being a, we as a, I mean, myself, I've been working online now for many years, but you're not the first of our strategists who comes from a more kind of brick and mortar background and has had to transition to the digital world. And such it is for a lot of our clients as well, right? Again, we are partners, the agencies we work with, we have lots of them and they're all used to the internet savvy digital video world, but it is a little bit new and scary for our clients. And so that moment of vulnerability, what I'm hearing is that it can actually help them feel safer in their communication and nervousness. Yeah, I've definitely found that too, where it's, I don't know, we're kind of all in this together. It's okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, how I really like to word a lot of my meetings and I'm like, don't worry, I'm also nervous or don't worry. I also, you know, look weird and washed out on camera sometimes. Like this video isn't for anyone. It's just for us and we can be awkward and share this moment together kind of thing. Mm, yeah, vulnerability is strength. And how have you found, uh, you know, I'm hearing that you have kind of initial moment of rapport. Have you found that this kind of creates a difference when you do it versus when you don't do it with clients? I think it does. I actually went into the meeting where the clients were quite reserved. I went in with a very, almost a planned intro and a very professional approach. And it was a little bit agonizing to try to get them to warm up to me and to trust me. And I think it's because I was not totally being myself and maybe seemed a bit cold. And so in, you know, next project, I was like, okay, great, let's just address it. And I was like, hey, you know, we're all nervous. And the one client was like, oh, my gosh, like, I'm nervous, too. But that's all right. Like, it's healthy to be nervous. It's a good energy. And we'll just do our whole interview with this great nervous energy. And we just were like, instantly connected. Mm, mm, and I think that's really powerful. So what other sorts of things have you kind of learned or done to improve your communication with clients over time? I have just started communicating a little bit more um, and a little bit more consistently. So not necessarily in person, but through emails. I've started sending pretty diligent follow-up emails. I try to kind of match what the partner wants. Some are very, okay, great, got it. And some, you know, are very full email rundown of that meeting. So I try to match kind of what they're looking for, but I always do a quick little weekly meeting went great. Here's a few things we talked about. Here's what I'm doing this week. Here's what you're responsible for this week. Great. Awesome. So it's just a way to kind of keep everybody on the same page. And I definitely learned that through not doing it for a couple of projects and then having it backfire a little bit. So <laughs> that's constant learning, right? <laughs> yes. Every project, I feel I learn at least, you know, 10 more things. <laughs> hey, I'm still feeling that way. And I'm on project number like 150 or something. So great. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Okay, so uh, let's uh, dig into kind of this idea of process and these elements of the process that can kind of smooth things out. So how have you found that something as simple? I mean, this seems almost... Uh, like it goes without saying, right? Like send a follow up after every meeting, but it's actually something that I've noticed that few people do and it can create a huge impact when we do do. Um, so what are some of the kind of different results or different impacts you've seen from that? I think I've seen everything from just no response, but at least I sent it and that information is in writing somewhere to back and forth, huge, long, detailed emails to, you know, okay, great, got it. But I think in all those instances, it was always appreciated if not directly acknowledged. And it's actually something I learned in my academic career is you always want sort of a paper trail of he said, she said, or she said, she said, just in case. Usually you don't need it, but if something ever happens in terms of, you know, but I thought you were doing this, or I was supposed to book that meeting, no, you were supposed to book that meeting. It does seem really, really obvious, but it's something that I've actually, you know, worked, I am working to work into my process consistently, just so that that is literally never an issue because you have it in writing somewhere. Mm. Yes, agreed. And that's not to say that even those situations always that come up are going to be ones based on, you know, kind of like conflict or confusion or misunderstanding, mm -hmm. just straight up, we're all busy. And it's nice to have <laughs> things recorded because a few days later, you're like, oh, what did we say during that call? That was so easy to remember at the time. 
Well, and I've definitely done that at weekly meetings where I, we always record our meeting notes and I've gone to open it and been like, oh my gosh, that's right. We didn't, I didn't ask any of these questions. You're like, oh man, like, <laughs> okay, well, and it's sort of, you almost go back a step. So yeah, I agree. It's all, I think a lot of the time it's just, yeah, you forget or you jump on a call quick and jump to another project and kind of forget to do a follow up notes for that. And you know, everybody's got crazy lives. And especially some of the partners we work with are juggling like 15 different things at a time. So Mm -hmm. it's nice to have that. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. (laughs) And uh, when we are doing these follow ups, how do you overcome the kind of challenge of always being busy? Do you like set out 15 minutes after every call to do it? Do you do a whole batch of follow ups at the end of the day? Uh, What does that look like for you on kind of a process? organization level? I literally do it right away. I am very, very excellent at procrastinating and very excellent at forgetting to do very small things. And I know that about myself. So I just do it right away. I take notes. You know, I'm a huge note taker in any meeting. (laughs) So I take notes all the time. And so I'll even just copy paste a few like action items, put it in an email. I don't make them super complicated or intense. It's just, this is what we talked about. This is what I'm doing. This is what you're doing. Amazing. See you next week. And then it's sent and it's done. And then I close that task. Boom. Yeah. Mm. Um, That's awesome. (laughs) So I'd actually love to back up a little bit. And something that you said before about being in academia, you know, we chatted about the kind of creative writing world. Probably if you were studying uh, in school, in university, you, you know, were kind of writing essays or other types of writing at that time as well. Um, Something that we hear a lot is this idea that, you know, the client has someone to write their own copy because they have a cousin or an aunt or et cetera, who's Mm. a writer. I'd love to just hear what to you are kind of the similarities and differences, uh, kind of what did you need to do to transition from, you know, speaking in a more academic context versus creative writing, which even in an academic context is, Mm -hmm. you know, like creative or narrative based versus copywriting. So I felt like it was kind of a natural progression for myself. So I started my, well, I mean, I started my creative writing career as a preteen writing fan fiction, I'm sure. (laughs) And so I pursued that in school just through taking creative writing classes and doing English. And the one thing, you know, I always wanted to write short stories or these, you know, lavish fictional worlds, even if they weren't necessarily, you know, fantasy or anything. And from that, I switched to writing creative nonfiction. And I actually ended up doing my final, like, honors thesis in creative nonfiction, which was amazing. And from that, I felt like I was connecting more with, like, real people And so to move from that into my first job as a copywriter and marketer, which was extremely sales focused, I felt a huge disconnect sort of at that moment until I started actually trying to do copywriting. And I actually started to educate myself in copywriting because it's one of the more profitable, like if I want to do writing as a job, copywriting is more considered a skill that people will buy. So that's not a very romantic or creative reason, but that's what brought me here. (laughs) So at that point, I don't know, I started kind of researching it and, you know, going over how do you do effective copy? How do you write a good headline? And I still felt disconnected until I actually got my first, it was for my friend's website, but I really connect with her and I connected with her website. And all of a sudden, I was sort of back in this storytelling fiction mode, but with these, how to put that into a good headline, how to tell a good story. And something clicked, I don't know exactly what. And I realized that it is completely narrative driven, like people really only care about your brand because of this testimonial or this story or this narrative. And it kind of put those two worlds together for me. And so, you know, it's one of the reasons that I've stayed in this industry and that I really, really love it and want to pursue it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's a <laughs> long winded story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But very interesting. And uh, it's, you know, most of the strategists or writers that we work with while they've done multiple times of types of writing, I don't think they've covered such a breadth of uh, different types of writing as well. I know you have quite a breadth of different industries that you've written for as well. But this idea, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this idea that copywriting is narrative. 
As mm-hmm. you know, that is something that I'm very passionate about. What I'm hearing from you is that until you made that connection, you actually found copywriting a struggle. You know, it sounds mm-hmm. like, you know, you have a background writing, you know that you have skill at writing, but when it came to actually putting it all together, while well, copywriting was something that you're interested in intellectually, it didn't quite click at first until you understood that you're kind of telling someone's story. Now, can you unpack a little bit more kind of those similarities or how you were able to apply your history in creative nonfiction and creative writing to copywriting uh, and that kind of narrative structure? How, how would you adapt, like someone who's coming from a creative writing background or a narrative background, how would they adapt that for the copywriting context? Mm, I think it comes down to a lot of little connections. So, I mean, there's all these concepts in marketing, like you have a brand story and a you know, brand aesthetic and all of these things, but it's that moment where it becomes a little bit more humanized. So, you know, you're no longer, I read a really good, I'm blanking on the title. I read a really good book on copywriting um, and it was just talking about how it's not about tricking anyone. You're just telling a story whether that is the story of, you know, like the cheesy infomercials that like, has this ever happened to you? (laughs) Or whether that's, you know, the story of a nonprofit organization fighting for a very serious cause. Um, Yeah, so whether you're writing for a very serious cause, or something that's just a simple product, I think that it transfers over in the little things. So it's using, you know, it's creative to write in someone else's voice, even if it's for a sales reason. It is creative to find just the right word. And I also started approaching copywriting as almost its own genre. It's a very specific style of writing and structure of writing. And, you know, similar to different types of poetry or writing a novella versus a postcard fiction or flash fiction. It's just structuring your words in a different way, sort of with a different purpose. And I think that's the moment that it really connected with me where it's like, oh, it's just kind of a different beast. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and I think this is where the popularity of some of these services, some are quite awesome, like StoryBrand, for example, mm-hmm. that essentially are trying to uh, make that something that your average person can follow, even if they themselves are not trained as a copywriter. Mm-hmm. That being said, you know, when your average Joe is just kind of going in and writing, what are some of the things that, what are, you, you know, you talked about so about being an expert. What are some of those pieces of expertise that you've been able to kind of draw from these experiences? I think the biggest pieces of, I guess, advice or things I find myself repeating with different clients and partners is like broken record amount of times um, is just you're not excluding anyone if you're telling a specific story. It's like blog advice. Like if you don't niche down, no one's going to follow you. So these general statements that I think you can almost suss out that this maybe wasn't a professional copywriter. You have very general writing that is sort of appealing to no one because it's very vague. It's not structured well. So for example, like it's not driving you through the story. You should be reading it, even if you're just skimming it, because nobody really reads anything anymore. (laughs) Um, Even if you're just skimming it, you know, you should be able to pick up on at least, you know, key features or key elements in their brand story or things like that. It should, if it's a website, direct you around the website, and it should be unique and sound like you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. be unique and sound Mm -hmm. like you I think those are two elements that often get forgotten in the copywriting process it's Mm -hmm. not just about who you're writing to and what your core messaging is it's actually about how you approach it what you bring to the table those kind of values that differentiate you in terms of a brand not Mm -hmm. just in terms of services or value is that what you're trying to say does that make sense yeah and I think it goes back to communication where it's like you know if you are a more casual awkward speaker own it work that into your brand if you you know someone will relate to that and become a die hard you know reader of your blog or frequenter of your website because they identify with that so it's that whole you know coming back to you know take the things that maybe are not your favorite traits in yourself and find a way to own them. <laughs> make them positive traits <laughs> <laughs> or at least oh yeah own them i think own, own them, them just own them yeah, yeah. Own them. <laughs> 
And I'm really glad that we're talking about this and this idea of kind of owning things, not just owning objects, but owning these aspects of your personality. And if I'm not mistaken, this kind of comes, ties back into the idea of excluding people, right? Is that Mm. it's not that you're trying to exclude all of the people who don't relate to that. It's that you want to make sure you relate to the people who do, because ultimately not everybody is your customer. You know, your audience is almost never everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's usually actually a specific group of people. And within that specific group of people, there's still only going to be a limited amount of them that really jive with you as an individual, as a business. Yeah. And that's where you're going to find your sort of, you know, diehards. Those are the people you want to be speaking to. And I think with certain brands and products and organizations, there often are people you, you know, maybe don't want (laughs) showing up on your doorstep. So it's a nice way to sort of speak to or attract the people you really, really, really want to be talking to. And that in turn brings a bunch of other people Mm -hmm. And (laughs) like-minded. That's one thing uh, I heard from a mentor that really stuck with me Mm -hmm. is that every person that you engage with invites more people like them to engage with you. Yes. Whether that's as a client or even in kind of the pre-process. So what's your favorite part of uh, being a strategist, being a content strategist? You know, for a Nancy, but in general, uh, you do take on other clients as well. In so I live in an extremely small town. Um, so I've just started doing a little bit of copywriting here. But I love working like sort of in my personal freelancing, I love working with really small, like maybe this is the first time they've ever hired a copywriter, they don't really know what it is, they think it might be a worthwhile investment. But here it's really cool, because I get to write for you know, people I know, and businesses that I walk past, and that really invest in our community. And that's really cool. And to sort of extend that into a Nancy, like I, I always love the strategy part. I love the figuring out what someone's voice should be figuring out, you know, talking with them and learning about their business. And, you know, because we do video meetings all the time, seeing that moment where, you know, they start talking about their organization or business and their eyes just like light up and you're like, yep, I should be writing all of this down because this is important. Mm -hmm. That gold. I know. I, I love that. I also love that feeling when you kind of present the strategy back to them and they're like, wow, is that us? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That, this sounds this sounds great. Yeah. And it's funny because we're kind of, I always am like, you know, I'm not saying this has to be, you know, this is what you sound like now and this is your voice, but we, we do the archetype thing. And so it's like, you know, well, this is the why behind your business. So I can almost guarantee that this should be your voice. Yes. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, we, as uh, I'm, I love tra- chatting copy. We can keep chatting copy for a while. <laughs> Was there anything that maybe I didn't ask, I should have asked, but didn't, or anything that uh, you know you wanted to share about copywriting or the process or et cetera that might be valuable to our listeners? Oh my goodness, I don't know. I've been doing a lot of sort of reading and diving into you know creating for money or creating for love and passion. And I really, really am not a fan of that sort of vein of advice that's like, follow your passion and, you know, the money will follow because it probably won't. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's just I think the biggest thing for me is I have done so many things and been in so many industries and, you know, sort of not bumbled, but like, you know, I've kind of stumbled through my entire 20s now, not really knowing what I wanted to do. And I am now in a position where I have come back and taken all of these things, which are now niche markets I write in, and taken all of these experiences and sort of, it's all come together, not how I thought it would, but in a career that sort of smushes all of that together. And I think the thing that I really love about copywriting is that you can do so many things. And through this, you can take everything you've learned and write about it. So if someone comes to me and is like, oh, hey, you know, we have a restaurant. It's like, great. I worked in a restaurant for years. I know all of your pinch points. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I just, I don't know. It feels very validating to find, I guess, a career to like, you know, that I maybe don't want to retire from and that I can kind of do it as a job, but also because I really love doing it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm hearing, and this is funny because this also came up in another recent uh, interview, 
is that this idea of follow your passion is problematic because just deciding mm-hmm. what your passion is and then trying to pursue a job in it often doesn't work for most people. Mm-hmm. But what I've heard is that you have kind of looked at and observed the parts of your kind of jobs that you've really, really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And uh, that content strategy, actually, even though you initially pursued copywriting, not necessarily because it was something you loved in itself, but because mm-hmm. you thought that there was potentially money in it, you were able to find the parts in the content strategy, in the copy. Well, actually, it sounds like in copywriting, content strategy was kind of that perfect fit for you where Mm -hmm. that theater background that uh, kind of level of excitement could have just as much of a part just as much of a part to play as your actual expertise in the written world which is by nature kind of a solitary thing is that kind of what I'm hearing yeah it's funny that I work remotely kind of far away from everyone at Anansi and I you know I have a lot of like American clients and partners and all this stuff but I feel extremely connected through like being online you know, you can quickly shoot someone a message, we jump on a quick video call. And that's what's really cool about the whole online copywriting industry is everybody's kind of doing the same thing. If you go on any Facebook group, you know, I think it's similar with like entrepreneurs and freelancers in general, like everybody's kind of got your back. And it's working on the internet is sort of a place where I've found a lot more connection than a lot of my in person sort of brick and mortar jobs. Mm, mm. I think that's really, that's really powerful. You've actually Mm -hmm. found more of a sense of connection since you've been working online than your brick and mortar places. Is that because you have a wider, is it because kind of the uh, ability to connect with people more instantly? Or is it because you have a wider variety of people that you're connected to? Or Might be a little bit of both. I think part of it is just connecting with a bunch of different people. I think a huge part of it too is just lifestyle based. I'm not stuck at a place for eight hours, <laughs> you know, I do a couple hours here, pop downstairs, go for a walk, you know, gra- it's just like been able to sort of work into my life where maybe I'm not necessarily more connected, but I'm more meaningfully connected. Mm-hmm. As opposed to you just show up, the times yeah. where you're working, you have to be very focused. <laughs> I see that I see the same person every day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I definitely get that. And that's that's uh, that's happy for me to hear. I know that uh, one of mm-hmm. our biggest passions at Anansi is creating that community and that connection, both the strong communities that we're building through the work that we do, but also the community that we've built with the cool people who work together. So yes, that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, and and I'm actually curious. I don't know if this is uh, appropriate for the podcast, but uh, <laughs> you know, of the kind of things that we've done as a company to kind of build that engagement what would you say kind of the most effective versus the least effective thing have been? I want to hear both, not just the most effective. Oh man, most effective. Hmm. I think it has to do honestly with sort of the people. It might not necessarily be a company thing, but just the, you know, people who you've hired who are on this team. Like we all really love that, you know, we we work really hard and take passion and, you know, really doing good work, but you know, we send each other stupid messages on Slack. And like, I had to delete a really great line I loved that I sent to one of my coworkers. And I was like, man, I had to delete this. And she was like, oh, that sucks. It was a great line. I was like, yeah. So having access to like, you know, just simple things like using Slack, you know, doing weekly meetings, having being able to jump on a call. One of the things I've really loved is being open and able to train with everyone. Mm -hmm. So doing, you know, when I was first starting jumping on a lot of trainings, you know, with Anam and then with you and then with Jazz and Max and like everybody's, you know, helps everyone out and everybody's kind of got each other's backs. And I very quickly realized that unlike most companies, when you say you can reach us for training or message us at any time, people here were actually happy to do that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> rather than just offering it to be polite. So that's been amazing. I think when I first started, one of the least effective things was kind of similar. Like it was, you know, here's your setup for everything, go. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what do I do? And so as I was sort of training, as I was doing projects, I felt a little bit overwhelmed and disconnected at times. But I think, I don't know, it was it was up to me a lot to reach out to people. And I felt awkward doing that because I, I wasn't sure. Like, I was like, oh, I don't want to be that, like, annoying new strategist that needs tons of help. But I quickly learned that was not the case. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, just the reason I ask this question, because our mm-hmm. audience is a lot of digital agency owners, mm-hmm. many of them are kind of transitioning from solopreneurs or super small, you know, teams of two or something to bring mm-hmm. on more people to execute. And uh, one of the things that I hear from uh, a lot of our agency partners and listeners is kind of around the challenges of that. How do you screen for the right people? How do you keep them engaged? Mm-hmm. How do you keep them connected? How do you onboard them? Do you give them too much information or not enough information, etc.? So it's really valuable to kind of hear from the other side of things, kind of what worked for you and what didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, So kind of with that context in mind, is there anything that you might uh, suggest to, yes, me and Celine, or to our (laughs) listeners uh, that might have eased that transition or uh, kind of made things easier for you to kind of come in as someone who's executing core work uh, to this new team? Yeah, I I mean, I know it's hard. I've done hiring for like shops and stuff and it. I think 90% of my hiring choices were personality fit. And this is different because I was hiring for a job that pretty much anyone could be trained to do. Um, I wasn't hiring based on experience and knowledge. But I think finding people that really connect with your brand and your company. um, I think I told you this when I sort of first got hired in one of our first calls where this was probably the first job that I applied for based on how great I loved the job post. And I was like, Oh my God, but this was one of the first jobs where I was like, I'm going to be actually extremely upset if I don't get this. Mm. This wasn't like a, you know, Oh, well, I need a job. It was, yeah, I need a job, but I really want this job. (laughs) And Uh I don't know if it was anything specific. I think it was like going back to writing copy. It was the specific copy you wrote And the way it was presented when I found the job posting just really identified with me. I had just, you know, written up a little copywriting website for myself. And the narrative on that website was, you know, you are an entrepreneur, you are ready to delegate this task out. And so that was kind of my marketing for myself. And it was, you know, let let me take this one thing off your plate. And then I go to the Anansi website and that's literally your headline. <laughs> and I was like, oh, ooh. <laughs> so I think waiting for those people that are clearly connecting with what you're saying. I think we always talk about like, you know, we are all drinking the Kool-Aid at Anansi. Um, <laughs> we all want to be here. And I think that's something that is worth holding out for. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And speaking, speaking from the other side of the uh, hiring window, you know, uh, it's I'm glad that you brought this up several times now that almost more important than any particular onboarding or particular, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, like tactic we could have done or not done simply hi- uh, not just hiring hiring really well as I think too general or generic mm-hmm. but making sure that we are very very clear on who we were as a company and what sort of cult I know this word culture gets tossed around a lot so I'm gonna try mm-hmm. and avoid that word and try and be a bit more <laughs> specific um so you know the specific kind of values expectations day in a life uh, maybe even uh, for a bit of context, we could throw that uh, job ad in the show notes so people can reference it. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's interesting that you brought that up because this was something that we, uh, although we are obviously a team of copywriters and content mm-hmm. strategists, it probably hadn't occurred to us how important it was to bring that copy into a job ad itself. And in fact, I take on uh, personal consulting clients uh, mm-hmm. who are agency owners all the time. And uh, one of the things we've been requested to do is to help people figure out those job ads and stuff. It uh, doesn't come in on projects as often, but definitely in personal consulting work, it comes in a lot. Uh, Longer is better, folks. I will tell you this. We got our idea from a book. Actually, no, I think we hired you before we read that book. But uh, (laughs) Well, it was good. (laughs) Yeah, Clockwork. I'm also thinking admin people, you know, we've hired Mm -hmm. people. Clockwork by Mike Michalowicz is one book that talks about hiring and talks about the kind of job ad that you can leverage and uh, really, really makes a big difference. Uh, so it's good to it's good to hear that uh, that confirmation. <laughs> well, and even you know, even having a job post where it's equally as a, you know, there's a the section where it's you know we are these things, you are this thing. You know, does this sound like you? Is extremely important. So one of the things that I identified reading through was just it was almost like a checklist. It was like, oh. I am newer to freelance copywriting and definitely want a job where I can be an expert, but also like learn a ton of stuff. You know, I'm also in this transition. And so all of these things that were listed 
was, you know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's me. I guess I should apply. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I want to pause you there and just unpack this because this is something we put on the job ad based on advice for mentors. And we have gone the opposite way and had a lot of issues, which is uh, this idea of hiring somebody who really, really has the culture, has the background and the expertise for us and Nancy, you know, we absolutely cannot hire newbies. Yeah. <laughs> but is still willing to learn right, is still kind of open to that nuance. As a, a very dear friend and mentor of mine, Sheldon Carrera, has said, uh, he said, uh, hire the workhorse, not the superstar, you know, mm -hmm. um, hire the person who's happy to come in and do the work and learn and get it done and even experience critique, et cetera, if they need to, mm -hmm. not the person who comes in saying, I've been doing this for a million years, I know exactly the way I want it done. And pretty much like fallen liners. I'm, I'm exaggerating both of these, right? But you tend to think, <laughs> oh, yeah, I want to hire, you know, the absolute best person possible. But we often associate best with a degree of being fixed in place with your process, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to best being somebody who has the skills or maybe skills, I'd say skills as well as aptitude, but maybe isn't so tied into the way they do things. You know, I mean, we are <laughs> the people, uh, our strategists uh, uh, who work for us at Nancy are following the say way, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? It is the way that uh, myself and my right hand woman, Salima, uh, came up with over years and years and years of doing projects. It's not the way every copywriter works. And a copywriter who's already been doing this for 15 years as an entrepreneur, you know, is going to have their own process and their own way. So anyway, I'm getting into ramble mode. Uh, <laughs> but this was something that we uh, we actually backtracked on at one point and we did try to hire someone who was the, uh, not, not the, uh, hmm, how do I say this properly? The creme de la creme. <laughs> the creme de la creme. Somebody who had their own copywriting business for years. And, mm. uh, and we found that there was just a lot of process challenges. Not that she wasn't awesome. Not that she wasn't a good uh, culture fit. But uh, there's just a lot of, yeah, I guess process differences that can come up. Although yeah. all of this now is, uh, well, uh, this is quite a while ago now. <laughs> yeah, and I think you have to be open to that, like with any, especially if you're going to be sort of subcontracted is, you know, and if you're going to hire, you know, freelancers and subcontract and do all of that is, you know, be clear on your process. Like when I work, when I do clients through just my business, it's completely different because one, it's just writing. <laughs> but, you know, I do, I do a little get to know you interview or email series thing. And then we go from there. So I have a very different process with that than I do with a Nancy. And I just kind of like switch those hats. So I guess being clear about your process and, you know, your expectations, that was the other thing that was very clear in the job interview is what I knew applying what would be expected of me mm. instantly. And the other thing I deeply appreciated is I had been doing this for several years, but through companies, which means I did not have a portfolio, <laughs> which meant I was struggling to get anybody to even consider like my resume, I'm sure was just getting tossed to the side because I didn't really have a portfolio. I can tell you I wrote all these things on this website, but my name is not associated to it. That's and so white label. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, it's all it's all as the company. And yeah, so it was like, no, we just wanted writing samples through the questions you asked. Mm -hmm. And, I was and like, uh, just for our listeners great. who uh, aren't familiar, <laughs> I think we actually talked about this in another episode yeah. extensively, I believe uh, when I was interviewing Celine, mm. but uh, we actually, we do not go through resumes when we hire. We actually mm -hmm. set up a series of assessments, the first of which is skill-based. So anyone who doesn't have the skills that we kind of need or require through actual on-the-job questions basically allows people who maybe don't have a we care more about what you can do. Mm -hmm. than how good you are at putting together a resume. I've put together resumes professionally for more than 10 years now. And many, many people who are amazing at what they do have crappy resumes. So, you know, setting up this series of assessments, that's what Michaela is referring to mm -hmm. when she uh, mentioned going through it. So just that additional bit of context there. Yeah. Yeah. And it was great because it was like, I felt like, you know, I was being taken seriously for my merit. And the other thing is, is like, you know, how well I can, you don't know if that piece that I posted went through their editors or did this, or if it's white labeled, mm -hmm. if I even wrote it. And so to get something that's like, hey, here's a straight up test of skill, you know, and then a 
personality fit and, um, you know, hey, send us video recordings because you have to be able to do that. So the whole thing was building towards all of these things that you knew you needed in the people you were hiring. And it was very obvious, but it was great because I was like, great, I can I can do this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I can't recommend enough. Like when we shifted from kind of a passive hiring method where we were being given, you know, resumes, cover letters, writing samples, even we had people filling out a form to an active process where we had not just fill out your information so we can reference it on the form. But here are skill testing questions. Uh, we actually laid out behind the scenes as well, like what we were looking for in answers. That has been night and day. Every strategist we mm -hmm. have hired through that process has become a long-term member of our team. We have had pretty much a zero turnover uh, since we started that. Uh, on either end, you know, people not working mm. out for us or us not working out for them. So it's a bit involved, but it's been really, really, really worth it. Anyway, I know we have we have gone over time. Uh, I got <laughs> caught up as I uh, said. I just love chatting with you. Um, <laughs> before I let you go, how can our listeners, if they're interested in either contacting you directly or kind of hearing more about you and your story in your life, what's the best mm -hmm. way for them to find you online? So I do have my own copywriting website and I am actually working on launching a blog there about the little town I live in and sort of lifestyle sustainability. Um, so it's just MichaelaJennifer.com. Um, so it's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-J-E-N-I-F-E-R because my parents gave me a crazy name to spell. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you can find me there. Um, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn and all that stuff too, but yeah, it's probably yeah, awesome. the best way if you want to get in touch. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and of course, that info will be in the show notes. You can always go to anancycontent.com, which is our business website, mm -hmm. also has uh, contact info, etc. If you're interested in working with Michaela directly, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, either you currently work with us, you're interested in working with us, uh, that's totally fine. Just let us know. We do match the strategist to the project pretty well according to expertise, timeline, etc. So can't promise anything, but uh, <laughs> do reach out and let us know. Well, thanks, Michaela. Thanks you're for coming so on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it'll be <laughs> exciting to uh, potentially uh, do this again in uh, yeah. a year or two and see kind of how your perceptions are Oh my are gosh, changed. when I when I will be the creme de la creme master copywriter. <laughs> oh yes, because that only takes a few it years. It only takes a year, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to that. And uh, to our listeners, thank you, thank you, thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Say It Online. As usual, you can find our show notes uh, on our website, anancycontent.com. That's A N as in Nancy, A N S I dot A N A N content dot com. Uh, and uh, please, wherever you are listening to this, whether it is iTunes, whether it is Stitcher or some other platform, please like us, subscribe, do all the things. It really, really helps us get our message out to more people as we are really, really trying to do is just make the world an easier place to communicate in, build stronger communities that communicate in a healthy way. Anyway, thank you guys. And I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. And that does it for another amazing episode of the Say It Online podcast. Join us next week. And don't forget to like and subscribe, whether it's iTunes, whatever your favorite podcast player is. It is always, always appreciated. It really makes a difference for us. It helps us get this word out to more people. As always, this episode was brought to you by our sponsor and Say's own business, Anansi Content. If you're a digital agency owner and you're still wasting too much time chasing down content that maybe isn't even all that great, let's talk. We've spent years working on the best process for selling, planning, and delivering amazing conversion content for your client projects. Better yet, we moosh our process to yours so that your client and you have a seamless and amazing experience the entire time through. If you're interested, just go to our website. That's www.anansicontent.com. That's A-N-A-N-S-I content.com. And just click Let's Talk. I'd love to chat with you. Someone else on the team would also love to chat with you too. Hope you have an amazing rest of your day.